Wolfpack baseball and its coaching staff completely threw away a pivotal game in Chapel Hill, and I have a lot to say about it. It's Locked on Wolfpack. Let's go. You are Locked on Wolfpack, your daily podcast on the NC State Wolfpack, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Locked on Wolfpack. Thank you, as always, for making Locked on Wolfpack your first listen each and every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts and also here on YouTube. You might mention that I am here by myself. Kenton Gibbs is currently flying home to Detroit uh, for the weekend. So while he is on that plane, I will be your pilot for this one. Today, we are talking Wolfpack baseball. I am fresh off of the highway. I was in attendance for the Wolfpack baseball game in Chapel Hill on Thursday evening. I have a lot to talk about it. I am upset. And uh, let's just get right into it. No no reason to beat around the bush here. Wolfpack baseball. Um, you know, they, they bought themselves a bit more time uh, winning the series on the road at Notre Dame, like we spoke about earlier this week. Entering this pivotal series with the Tar Heels of Carolina, you know, they have a record of 31 and 15. Pretty, uh, pretty so so, you could say, at this point of the year. Um, Do I think if you took the tournament teams now, would they be in? Yes, but we're not taking them right now. There's a couple more games in the ACC that we still need to play, and uh, each and every one of them is pivotal, absolutely pivotal for the NC State Wolfpack, and tonight what I saw in Chapel Hill is complete, a a complete fumble against a a, a rival team, no less. It was a dying an absolute slow death. There were parts where you could see this slow death coming from a mile away, and it it was every bit of, they're not really going to do this again are they? And then you hear the narrator behind you, they really are going to do this again. But as I mentioned, they did buy themselves a bit of momentum, winning that series on the road uh, against Notre Dame. And, you know, finishing that series on the road in South Bend last weekend, they had they, they had the look of, you know, understanding the urgency of their situation that they're in, in that they've backed themselves into a corner a bit and they have no choice but to fight their way out with and every punch counts. Every single win that they can get from here on out until the ACC tournament begins counts in a crucial manner. So it looked like they took this sort of message to heart tonight in Chapel Hill as they jumped out to a very explosive 5 nothing lead in the top of the first. This, of course, was supplemented by, you know, patient patient at-bats from Gino Groover and Jacob Cozart. Groover working a six-pitch walk, Cozart behind him working a nine-pitch walk, and with runners on first and second, Cannon Peebles decided to clear the deck. He fired off a cannonball that I'm not sure has landed yet. If you're listening to this on Friday morning, make sure you're looking around outside because it, it might hit you if you're not paying attention. That is how far Cannon Peebles launched a three-run home run in the top of the first inning to get the Wolfpack rolling. And while that would have been a good enough start, a 3 nothing lead in the top of the first, they weren't done there either. Will Marcy followed with a double immediately after the home run. Uh, Trevor Candelaria walked. So just as quick as we had first and second and Peebles cleared them, here we find ourselves with first and second again. Peyton Green, who has been surging, I guess you could say, at the at a crucial time here at the end of the year, he doubles Marcy and Candelaria home to extend lead to five nothing, and we are off and running. This chases uh, North Carolina's starter only records one out in his Thursday evening outing. You could not possibly have asked for a better start from the NC State Wolfpack. 
Logan Whitaker, of course, is now gifted with a 5 nothing lead here. you got to feel extremely comfortable if you're Logan in this situation. You know, you don't have to pitch as tight uh, on the road in, in such a pivotal game. And in the first two innings, he showed it. He, he you know, for all intents and purposes, cruised through innings one and two, ran into very minimal trouble. Uh, that is, of course, until we reached the bottom of the third. But the trouble he reached in the third, I wouldn't necessarily hang on Whitaker. And by that, uh, you know, I'm about to lay this out for you, as this is kind of where you got small inklings of a potential disaster that ended up being a disaster uh, later on as the night waged on. So in the bottom of the third inning here, with one out, Carolina had a single, another single, and then a walk to load the bases. There is a, a sorry, there's zero outs. Let me backtrack. Bases loaded, no outs. There's a chopper back to Whitaker on the mound. He throws to first for the first out. With this, a run scores to make it a 5-1 ball game. And then this is where the wheels get a little bit loose, uh, to which they fell off later in the night. With runners on second and third, and Vance Honeycutt at the dish for UNC. Honeycutt, of course, is one of their marquee players in Chapel Hill. He's very talented, uh, as I say through gritted teeth here, complimenting the opposition. He had a – this is this turned out to be a pivotal – moment in this game unfortunately he pops up into foul territory off of the first baseline he he i mean it's it's way up there you know it's i'm sitting on the third base side i can see this thing for an extended amount of time before it starts to come down as it comes down just before it completes its descent eli serrano who is the first baseman mysteriously seems to jump out of the way as if someone it was were to call him off uh you know a teammate were to call him off Obviously, with this being in foul territory just off first base, this is his ball. This is 1,000, 10 out of 10 times, always going to be the first baseman's ball to catch. He jumps out of the way, and this gives another life, as we say in the baseball world. It gives new life to Vance Honeycutt. Now, this became very confusing as to why in the world would Serrano jump out of the way. He seems to kind of... Note that someone in the crowd had said something. Elliot Avitt comes out to chat with the umpire about it. Of course, there's nothing to be done there because when it's all said and done, there's there's no excuse for that ball not to be caught. And as I've mentioned on here before in talking about sort of the downfalls that NC State baseball has experienced this year, things can snowball on a team mind-blowingly fast if you allow them to. And this was yet another example of such a thing happening. So as I mentioned, you have Vance Honeycutt at the plate for Carolina. You you produce a, a pop fly that should be caught 1,000% of the time. It is not caught. He returns to his at-bat, and two pitches later, Vance Honeycutt doubles into left field, scoring two runs, and you know shrinks our lead now to two with it being a 5-3 ball game. Now, I want to make sure that this part is known to be crucial as well. The next batter, Mac Horvath, strikes out. So now there are two outs, okay? So if Honeycutt's pop fly is caught and then Horvath strikes out, Horvath would have been the third out and two runs would not be on the board. So it would then at that point would have been a 5-1 to one ball game. Carolina was not done there. The next batter, Tomas Frick, doubles home Honeycutt. And wouldn't you know it, Carolina is now knocking on our door again, as always, it would seem. And it's now a 5-4 to four ball game. So as I mentioned in review, if Eli Serrano catches this foul ball in you know just off of first base and the next batter strikes out, you escape that horrendous third inning and you still have a four-run lead by a score of 5-4. to four. Nightmare material. This actually chased Logan Whitaker from the game and Baker Nelson would be brought into the game. And from this point on, this is where the game is going to get increasingly interesting. And I'm going to be breaking down what else went wrong for the Wolfpack on Thursday night after a quick read from our sponsors. Our sponsor for today's episode is Built Bar. 
If you're like me and you want to make healthier snack choices, but you don't want to compromise on the taste, I've got just the thing for you. These are Built Bars and Built Puffs. They're healthy and taste amazing. So amazing that you won't even think that they're good for you. They come in unbelievably tasty flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, and cookies and cream. And you don't need to wait for a box. For years, we've talked about ordering Built Bars at Built.com, but now, as I've mentioned on here several times, you can get them at your local Walmart and or Sam's Club. So head over to your local Walmart or Sam's Club and pick up either a four-bar box or a 13-bar box. Built Bar, thank me later. So, jumping back into this review of our Thursday night game one on the road against UNC Chapel Hill, where I left off, we had a score of five to four in the, I believe it was the top of the fourth, where we should have had a five to one lead. It is, you know, at our own fault, shrunken to shrank, shrunken, shrank to a a five to four lead. Now, something I, I enjoyed about this game it turned out to be a very exciting game because for the majority throughout the middle innings each time that Carolina had scored NC State had found a way to answer back with a bit of insurance and that also came in the top of the fourth inning with an RBI single from Jacob Cozart with some runners on base it was a decent answer to what Carolina had produced in the bottom of the third with four but a a very clutch RBI single from Cozart to Raised the lead back up to two by a score of six to four. We jumped to the top of the fifth where the Wolfpack had bases loaded yet again. We had plenty of runners on base and a common gripe with this team is producing with runners in scoring position. While that has been true uh, for a lot of the year, it is something that has plagued us. I thought we did a fairly decent job in game one in Chapel Hill this evening. Um, you know, I, I thought we took pretty good advantage of what Carolina gave us. Uh, but as the game went on, Carolina then tightened that up a bit and we were able to produce less and less. But, you know, going into the, the top of the fifth, Will Marcy had an infield single. And then uh, Parker Nolan, which is kind of a point, another talking point here, he then enters for Will Marcy at first base to pinch run and would stay in the remainder of this game. Now, I think the game plan behind this is Will Marcy, you want him in the lineup at least to start the game for his offensive ability. As I mentioned, he doubled in the first inning and scored, singled in the fifth. So obviously he is a bit of a better offensive option for the Wolfpack in the outfield and sometimes at DH. Parker Nolan is more gifted defensively in the range that he does have, uh, usually patrolling center field. Um, and he also does this at a, you know, a pretty high rate of speed uh, by foot. So Parker Nolan is brought in to pinch run for Will Marcy at first base. Trevor Candelaria doubles to right center field. Now you have runners on second and third. Peyton Green would then walk. So now you have the bases loaded, as I mentioned, top of the fifth inning. Kalai Harrison, who had a big game for the Wolfpack, he uh, slaps a sack fly out to center field. Parker Nolan scores. We extend our lead to 7-4. As I mentioned, Wolfpack did a pretty good job of adding very uh, you know, crucial insurance uh, at points of need. Unfortunately, this is where things continue to begin to unravel. In the bottom of the fifth, this is where Baker Nelson was kind of nearing the end of his rope and you know, kind of calling a spade a spade here. I think the, the leash on Baker Nelson has been a bit too long at several instances this year. Um, tonight was another one. He began to unravel in the bottom of the fifth inning with one out. Uh, Carolina strung together two singles and a walk to load the bases. Baker Nelson then hit the next batter, hit by pitch. This would plate a run to shrink the lead back to two runs, seven to five Wolfpack. And this was concerning to me. And this is where I want to kind of point the spotlight onto pitching coach Clint Chrysler. I thought he was much too complacent this evening in Chapel Hill. And not just not just this moment uh, with Baker Nelson in the fifth, but a very big moment later on that I'm going to touch on here shortly. But in, a, in such an inning, in, the, in the, the fifth inning, when you're clinging to a three-run lead, you're on the road, and it's a game that you absolutely need to have to keep your tournament hopes alive. 
you can't afford to have a pitcher balloon this inning negatively for you in that you allow back-to-back singles and a walk. And keeping in mind that Baker Nelson had already gone, I think, at least an inning and a half at this point. So his pitch count is, you know, it's climbing. Uh, pitch count's another thing uh, important. So keep that in mind in just a couple minutes as well. But not so much as a mound visit from Chrysler, no timeouts, not even from Cozart, a mound visit. I just thought that in, in moments like this where things are starting to fall apart defensively and, you know, for scheming purposes from, for a, a, a pitching coach, you got to find a way to break that sequence. It's like it's in basketball when you have a team going on a run that you call a timeout. You got to get them on the bench, discuss what's going on, make adjustments, and you, you just want to break momentum. This is what Clint Chrysler needed to do in the bottom of the fifth and just didn't do it. So uh, they came at a price, but Carolina shrinks the lead to two. This is when you enter Dom Fritton, another big talking point here. Um, I saw some hemming and hawing about bringing in Dom Fritton so early into the game as we've kind of been trying to angle him as our new closer since he has traded positions uh, with Sam Highfill out of the bullpen, but I'm I was perfectly okay with bringing in Dom Fritton uh, when we did. This was the bottom of the fifth inning. Perfectly okay with this because Dom has been our you know arguably our best pitcher, um, not just in a starting role as I've mentioned here before, not just in a starting role, but also his brief moments in the bullpen of late, and so while this is okay, while it makes sense to bring Dom Fritton in here, you need to have a contingency plan because you're essentially bringing in your, your dominant closer in the fifth inning. So you need to be able to have a break in case of emergency plan. If things don't go the way you would want them to, who's going to be following Fritton here. It didn't seem like they had any plan at all. That's how it felt. And unfortunately that's the way it played out as well but you know spotlighting dom's positive parts here he cruised you know for the brief uh you know middle innings the fifth the sixth and the seventh was dominant he looked like the dom fritton we've been getting you know pretty consistently you know staggering the opponent's offenses making big pitches executing pitches and giving up virtually nothing however when you're running through a a lineup I guess, as talented as Carolina's. You can only see them so many times before they're going to start to figure you out. And that's what we got here um, as we waged on into the seventh and eighth innings. But um, once we got to the eighth inning, this is, uh, you know, this is a key point for me because I, I'm very much, you know, an analyst in my own right in that I will sit there during the game not just NC State games, but virtually any baseball game. And I'll sit there and say, what would I do if I were the coach here? Who would I bring in? Who would I shift this way? The whole nine yards. When we got to the eighth inning, and you have to keep in mind, Dom Fritton being your best reliever, you don't want to completely blow him all on game one here because this is a big series that you desperately need to win. So, in, in my own opinion, you cannot afford to throw him an extended amount of time here on Thursday because, you know, you run into the situation, perhaps it's a high leverage situation in game three, and it's it's for the series, and you need your best pitcher to come and save the day, you know, so to speak. If Dom, if Dom Fritton has thrown 40, 50, 60 pitches in game one, he might not be so effective when that time comes. And so... At that point, when Dom had you know, run into early signs of trouble in the eighth, that's where I would have cut it. That's where I would have thrown Justin Lawson, who's been another reliable pitcher. Had some, you know, some bumps in the road, but he's been one of our more reliable arms. And that is where I would have gone to Lawson there to take us the rest of the way. But the the coaching staff, Clint Chrysler, I can never say his name quickly enough. Uh, Chrysler decided to ride his guy. And on some levels, I can understand that um, based on certain situations and Dom was rolling at that point. He decides to ride Fritton into the eighth. Well, this is where Carolina began to figure him out 
like I mentioned, may happen. They started putting good swings on Dom with one out in the bottom of the eighth. They had double and then an RBI double and then an RBI single. So then just like that, they had shrunk the lead again. We did score a run in the seventh. I forgot to mention that. So we had eight runs. Carolina then shrunk the lead to an 8-7 Wolfpack lead in the bottom of the eighth. And so, like I just mentioned, you have to wonder if things would have gone differently there if you had Lawson in. Because like I mentioned, Carolina is getting good looks now at Dom Fritton in the eighth. His pitch count is climbing. And it just seemed like the opportune time to make that change. And yet again, Clint Chrysler is effectively sitting on his hands in the dugout. No mound visits, nothing. And that was infuriating for me to sit there and watch, um, as I mentioned, painfully a slow death uh, (laughs) with me in attendance. But I have a couple more thoughts to round this thing out after a quick word from our sponsors. So I'm going to reach the end of this sad story here, unfortunately. Uh, Where I left you, it was an 8-7 ball game. Dom Fritton was struggling the bottom of the eighth. Escaped still with a one-run lead as we enter the top of the ninth. And this was another extremely important point um, in my mind that I think gets overlooked by a lot of folks. So this is how it played out in the top of the ninth for the Wolfpack offense. Eli Serrano walks, a leadoff walks. We have a runner on first, no outs. Peyton Green then attempts to bunt to move Serrano to second base to put him in scoring position with one out to desperately try and scratch and claw and get any kind of insurance, uh, you know, in the form of one more run, if need be, for the Wolfpack. Peyton Green then bunts this ball a bit too hard in the direction of the pitcher. He feels, throws to second. Serrano is out at second. Peyton Green is safe at first. This is why this is significant for me. With a good bunt, you have Eli Serrano at second base with one out. And this becomes crucial with how the next two plays panned out. Your next batter, you have Kalai Harrison. He lines out deep to left field. Left fielder is ranging to his left in the gap towards center. Makes the play, but his momentum is taking him out to the wall. So if Eli Serrano tags and reaches third base, there's simply no way the left fielder would have been able to throw him out. So with that, you have now Eli Serrano hypothetically on third base with two outs. With Noah Souls at the plate, Carolina throws a wild pitch. This wild pitch would have scored Eli Serrano from third, making this a 9-7 ball game in the top of the ninth. And obviously for Wolfpack fans, we know how the bottom of the ninth turned out. Uh, A leadoff walk, a triple to right field tie game, and then a a squeeze bunt for a Carolina walk-off victory. So in summary here, You see what I'm getting at. The smallest of things will snowball on you in the blink of an eye. And this game, this game one in Chapel Hill, is a bit of a microcosm for so many different instances uh, throughout this baseball season here in 2023. The, The ineffectiveness of the bullpen at times, but the bullpen mismanagement, I think, is a bigger story there. You know, the inability to establish these bullpen roles and these guys are prototypically used for this points in the game. I think the the Sam Highfield situation was a disaster from the jump, but you know you you now have him back in a starting role where I believe he belongs. Costly errors, you know, in the in the infield and the outfield, immediately reading leading to runs uh, for the you know the opponent. That it's going to kill you. It's going to kill you so many times over the course of the year if you don't make a conscious effort to correct it. And I just don't feel like that conscious effort has been made, at least not to the level that it should be. Because if, you know, I was told once, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. So I don't know. Are we a duck? We have two more games uh, in, in Chapel Hill, both Friday and Saturday to figure out if we are a duck. And if we don't want to be a duck, and we want to fly into the NCAA tournament, it's still on the table. If you take these next two games in Chapel Hill, you're still in a good position uh, with your remaining series against Pittsburgh to win that one as well. You're still in a good position to firmly plant yourself 
into the NCAA tournament as that is, you know, rapidly approaching. But, you know, if we quack a couple more too many times, we're going to be a duck, and this duck is going to be outside of the big pond, and the big pond is the NCAA tournament. You have your best two pitchers going in game two and in game three, or I should say your best two starting pitchers in, uh, not Sam. Well, okay, Sam Highfields in game three. Matt Willitson is going today, Friday, in game two. They are horses. They can get you to where you need to go. It's going to now fall on the offense to stay consistent and providing enough run support for your starting pitcher. And, you know, a big spot that's going to be highlighted is the bullpen. Did we use Dom Fritton too much in game one? We're going to have to find out. Who do we use now? Do we, you know, we have a fresh Justin Lawson. We have Rio Britton. We have Carson Kelly, if need need be. Possibly John Moralia. Where do we go from here? All I can tell you is it's do or die. It is do or die. You lose another game to Carolina here, season might be effectively over. And that's that's a tough pill to swallow because that's going to come at the, the hands of the absolute last team you would want to have that power over you. But we're going to have to wait and see how this plays out. So thank you all for giving me a listen here. I know it's been just me. Kenton's on a plane. Uh, thank you for suffering through this episode with me. A lot to talk about in this game one in Chapel Hill. Hopefully we get to clean it up and claim a series victory by the end of the day on Saturday. But more to come on this. We're going to catch you catch you all uh, this coming week. As always, thank you all for giving us a listen here on Locked on Wolfpack. Toss us some comments on how you saw game one uh, in your eyes, your opinions on the certain situational things, how you suspect the rest of the series will go on. Let us know what you think. I want to know what you think. Uh, until next time, y'all, go Pack. You are Locked on Wolfpack, your daily podcast on the NC State Wolfpack. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.